in a world on lockdown. Ambulance sirens haunt the streets as COVID-19 patients quickly fill emergency rooms and intensive care units. Despite our technological prowess and medical know-how, the newness of this coronavirus limits health professionals' ability to fight it for the moment. You know, how do you treat something for which we don't have pharmaceutical interventions? Treatment is really supportive. Here it's about protecting the lungs and the oxygen capacity until the person gets better. Scientists feverishly research new treatments and drug protocols, all in an international effort to aid the body's defenses and to turn the tide. So we're dealing with a serious pathogen of uh, global significance. This is not a short battle. This is a long, long battle that we're going to face. While the societal impact of COVID-19 may be clearly evident, the details of what the disease does to our bodies can be more difficult to see. Some coronaviruses, like those that cause the common cold, attack the upper airways of the respiratory system and trigger into action almost like organic technology, says infectious disease specialist, Dr. David Wheeler. They're kind of like little mini thumb drives that have information with a protective layer and they don't do a thing until you plug them into the computer, if you will, and the uh, cell then pulls in that viral message and starts being driven by that message, which mainly is to create more virus. But just like the MERS and SARS epidemics earlier this century, a more penetrating point of attack makes the COVID-19 virus much more dangerous. It's in a more vulnerable part of our body, in, in the lower airways, deep in the lungs and the alveoli. They go in, take over the cell machinery, start making new virus. They prompt the immune response. So when that immune response kicks in, now we're down into the lungs themselves. Early symptoms include headache, body aches, fever, and cough. Those are the big four, and most people that get sick have several of those. It's once they start feeling like they're short of breath, and if they go into the emergency room or the doctor's office, and their oxygen level is low, then that's where we need to keep a close eye on them. And what we found is that a small number of the folks just all of a sudden then get sick very quickly. So increasingly, these patients need more than a close eye. They need supportive respiratory interventions, like those in high demand ventilators to help them breathe. Well, you know, shortness of breath is a sensation of suffocating. When people are starting to get a bit more short of breath like that, sometimes they need to get moved to the intensive care unit and put on the breathing machine earlier than we might in other conditions because we don't want these sort of emergency sessions where the person's struggling for breath and where more healthcare workers could get exposed to lots of aerosols in the air. In some of the most extreme cases, an even more scarce resource may be called upon to perform the work of the lungs as a temporary last resort. It's called ECMO. Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And that really, it's heart-lung bypass. They uh, put two cannulas in to veins and pull blood out, oxygenate it, and return it. This was the treatment given to a man in his late 50s after his transfer to George Washington University Hospital, which released stunning 3D images of this patient's lung damage, represented here in green, laying bare the danger to all. You do not need an MD after your name to understand these images. This is something that the general public can take a look at and really start to comprehend how severe the amount of damage that this is causing to the lung tissue. The damage that we're seeing is not isolated to any one part of the lung. This is severe damage to both lungs diffusely. 
this man died about a week after arriving at the GW hospital. A big part of what I think is, is killing people is the sort of what we call multi-organ failure as a result of the lungs going first and then um, other organs start to fail. But what exactly causes this damage? The answer, another medical acronym, ARDS, or Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Inflammation in COVID-19 cases brought about by our own immune systems, stuck in overdrive. Uh, a lot of the disease we see in terms of virus host interactions is what we refer to as immunopathology. So it's our own immune system uh, creating some of the damage, uh, in particular at target organs, in response to that virus. And so it's like turning on the heat. But if it's too much, then you start hurting the tissues around it. It starts to create a barrier between where the alveoli are, where oxygen's coming in, and the capillaries right next to it that are picking up that oxygen to take it to the body. And there's a little thin membrane, an interstitium there, which has very little space in it. But certain kinds of interstitial pneumonias can start to put fluid and inflammation in that and thicken it so that the oxygen exchange is then compromised. In 1918, the Spanish flu filled understaffed hospitals beyond capacity. The personnel shortages, largely a result of doctors and nurses serving during World War I. The effect of war socially and politically took a huge toll on the health systems around the world that, and the hospitals that would need to provide care. Likewise, in our battle against COVID-19, the anticipated surge of cases presents additional hurdles, necessitating field hospitals and creating shortages of medical supplies and equipment, making a bad situation even worse. With a disease like COVID-19, what you really have to worry about is the strain on the health system. We're waiting to see, you know, is this going to be like Milan, where you have 50 people waiting to come into the hospital and you have 20 ventilators, and 40 of those people need the ventilators. But what about medicinal aids to fight the novel coronavirus? Despite limited and anecdotal evidence for some drugs, public health officials continue to warn against false hope and await the results of scientifically sourced and controlled testing. There are a number of candidate therapies that literally as I speak to you today are being tested in randomized controlled trials. These pharmaceutical investigations take two primary approaches. One targets the virus, the other explores drugs to control the immune response to the virus after ARDS sets in. What happens then is like a small-scale nuclear war inside the body. At late stages when it's this immunological battle, actually killing the virus probably doesn't uh, do a lot of good. It's really trying to control the immune system that is then the, the key to successfully treating a patient. Clinical researcher David Patterson and his team at Australia's University of Queensland mobilized to explore a combination of both approaches. So the objective of our trial is really to get in early and prevent a person needing to go into intensive care, prevent them needing to be mechanically ventilated, and of course, prevent them from dying. Reaching back into society's medicine cabinet, Patterson's team hopes to potentially repurpose drugs originally developed to treat malaria and antiretrovirals used in the fight against HIV AIDS. One of them attacks an enzyme that is very necessary for the virus to replicate. Another prevents the virus from attaching properly to human cells. We think that by inhibiting the virus, 
we give the immune system time to really take control. The ultimate goal, to save lives. A difficult task, not only medically speaking, but also because of the challenges in gathering data from the epicenters of this pandemic. Where health systems have been overwhelmed, a lot of practical experience is gained, but it's actually hard to do controlled trials, for example, to determine whether a drug is effective or whether certain interventions are effective. Patterson's answer, to develop a large study group of 2,400 patients across 60 hospitals to measure the outcomes of four different therapies, antiretroviral HIV drugs, an antimalarial, antiviral, and immunomodulator, a combination of the two, and perhaps most importantly, a control group. A person coming to that clinical trial has to accept, though, that there is a one in four chance that they may not receive any antiviral medication. But it is a trial. It might be that these antiviral medications have side effects we didn't anticipate. It might be that combining two of the antivirals, all it does is increase side effects. And once we have this infrastructure of a trial set up, if there are new antiviral medications that have been developed in any part of the world, we can slot them into this trial and evaluate what is really the best way to go in terms of treating this infection. But given the accelerating rise of confirmed COVID-19 infections, no treatment can come fast enough. The biggest challenge is time. We have to do something now to stop these epidemic curves rising so steeply. And yet, even after mitigation efforts to slow the spread of the virus, official White House estimates released at the end of March project between 100 and 240,000 American deaths. And so physicians like David Wheeler consult with colleagues to find something that works even with no scientifically proven treatment as of yet. Nowadays, it seems like every new day is like a new era. Unwilling to simply wait for the onslaught of patients, as seen in China, Italy, Spain, and New York, they scour medical literature on the hunt for lessons learned. So in terms of the drugs that we pick, it's, it's a bit of, all right, what do we kind of think makes sense? We'd like to do something rather than nothing, but we don't want to hurt our patients. And so that's where we're trying to, to strike that, that middle ground. Do no harm, but do something. 80% of those infected by the COVID-19 virus likely won't need any medical care. But limited medical resources and the absence of verified effective treatments means no one should be complacent. It, um, it is going to probably force a lot of hard decisions. Some are going to die. Uh, some may be left with sort of lung complications uh, afterwards. And, uh, and then others, it's just going to be a lot of work to help get them through this. 